from the uh, Lubbock City Council has now recessed from executive session and will adjourn for the day as there is no quorum present for the public portion of the meeting. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Brings us to item six. Um, sure everyone's had a chance to read through the minutes. Uh, we'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the regular electric utility board meeting on February 22nd, 2021. Have a motion from Ms. Stafford. Need a second. Okay. Have a second from Mr. Schultz. Um, all those in favor, do so by saying aye. 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 Opposed by the same. Motion carries. Item seven, Mr. McCullough. Good afternoon again. Okay, just a couple of highlights from the. Uh, <clears throat> In the board packet and on page 22 23 24 25 it was a busy month for communication so i just wanted to point out some of the information on those pages with regard to communications mostly related to the uh, february winter storm uh, <clears throat> some of it related to the billing conversion and the new account numbers so uh, mr rose has had a busy couple of months with communications but has done a done a really good job informing the public of various things. And then if you look on page 29, at the bottom of the page there, you'll see the uh, daily system load graph for the month and uh, generation that was available for the month. So <clears throat> I was proud of our generation folks for, for the job that they did in February, <clears throat> producing the energy and supporting the reliability of, of the grid. Uh, during these really high load situations and when, when we had a brief, brief period of rotating outages as well. So that was the highlights. I will, uh, we don't have, you'll notice we don't have the AMI report this month. We don't have the billing system report this month. Uh, those projects are substantially complete and we won't be reporting on them. So that makes the packet a little thinner than it, than it has been. So Mr. Avent, I don't know if, oh, Mr. Avent is here with us today. So he's got the next piece of this. Welcome Mr. Avent. All right, the first sheet is the uh, schedule you're used to seeing. A few changes from last month till now, the very top uh, overall project, Holly to Slayton um, has been completed. It was a little bit behind schedule, but it was completed uh, well in advance of the targeted 115 completion. So we can check that one off the list. Two projects down, Yellow House substation and TAP. It's not showing it here, but currently we are sitting three weeks behind on it. So it's pushing it out to the third week of April, possibly into the fourth week, not jeopardizing anything in regards to the ERCOT, ERCOT cutover, but I just wanted to articulate that that is one change that we've had um, now to, or since we ran the report. And that's primarily on some cable shortages. We've had to go back and reorder uh, or have the contractor reorder, not LPNL. A um, few other changes at the very bottom of the sheet, uh, co-op substation on voltage conversion. So as you can see in the schedule, kind of had a pause in voltage conversion until this week when we started back up again. Um, co-op substation, which is the lower one, should be completed today. So well in advance of what we're showing here on the schedule, taking the full week. And then we're going to start Wadsworth hopefully tomorrow. Um, the, the current target, the way we're looking this week with things moving a little bit faster than we thought is Wadsworth actually being done this week and not taking two weeks. So schedule wise, I'm looking really well. Next slide. So the Encore projects is what we're showing here. Uh, a few changes from last week or last month, Folsom Point, um, which is a substation about oh, halfway down on that page. They have slid uh, about two and a half weeks. It's showing one week on the uh, calendar right now. It's actually one week further than that currently. Um, that's mainly due to commissioning delays and station service. So the actual LPNL team is working with them to uh, get their station service hooked up so they can finish commissioning. Again, not seeing this as a, a jeopardizing point for integration to ERCOT, but just want to bring that to your attention. On the transmission projects, so that OGA to BWD, that's Ogallala to Blackwater Draw, that is going to be in or is an Encore own line. It will not be transitioned to LPNL at a later date. That line has been placed in service. So that's the first 345 new build line that has been energized out of the entire 4W project. So that's a pretty big win for the team. You're gonna start seeing a lot more of that between now and next month of slowly these lines coming in service in advance of the integration to ERCOT. And the last one, Posey to Oliver, um, if you don't mind. So it's the, the second to last one on the bottom. 
And if we can go to the next slide, please. So we do have an issue I would like to discuss. It's gonna be the fourth one um, from the bottom on the issue tracker. There was one uh, structure that was damaged by a forklift operator. I'm pretty sure it was Primoris working for the uh, Encore construction team backed into a structure. Structure's okay, it's still standing, does still have conductor on it. We're gonna have to get that structure replaced. And right now it is currently tracking to be done in advance of the ERCOT uh, cut over. So no jeopardy to the schedule, but that is gonna be an issue we're gonna be targeting or watching very closely. A few other to walk through, now a little bit more in order. Sorry for jumping out of order there. Uh, the McKenzie phase two and substation rebuild at Holly. So uh, another small activity, well, not really small, but we have to get meters installed in order to meter your, the, the power coming into your system from the ERCOT grid. So that metering project is uh, slightly delayed on the installation of equipment, however, should still beat the uh, integration timeline of 6-1. Those are the two uh, top risks that are identified. Um, a few of the others to talk through, fourth risk, Posey to Southeast. Um, so we did place that line back into service this past week. Uh, I believe it actually went back into service yesterday. We had to take it down temporarily to install the OPGW or the fiber on the top of that line. And what happens when we take that Posey to Southeast out of service is that's one of your 230 injection points of how you get your power into your system from SBP. Took it down short term, it's gonna stay in service until you get converted into ERCOT. We'll have to take that line out of service one more time. I think I briefly talked about this at the last meeting, but that, that is the only piece of construction that'll have to go into, we'll have to wait until you're into ERCOT before we can take it back out of service again. So you're gonna see that moving forward, that line's kind of have a hit pause until we get into ERCOT to complete construction. And these last two, again, I mentioned were the, uh, the meter and testing. So second to last one on the ERCOT conversion work, the EPS meter testing and certification contractor. We did get that documentation to uh, Felix and his team. They're gonna solicit an ITB out to help facilitate that certification. So that one is on track now. And then the updated plan documents for the overall uh, integration into ERCOT and the switching sequence has been submitted to ERCOT and Encore for review. And David, I believe we're still waiting back for their thumbs up on that, correct? Perfect. So that's the uh, the high level review of the summer or the, the schedule from last month till now. Uh, the board have any questions? Questions for Mr. Avent. Thank you. Sir. Thanks, sir. Bringing us out of eight. Renew. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everybody is having a good day so far. Let's get started with our January presentation. We'll start off with our balance sheet. As you can see, we continue to see a little bit of decline in our pooled cash and cash equivalents. As I have mentioned, that is due to our timing differences and we would soon be reconciling that. And I can see looking at the February's financial state statements itself, we have our drawdown and we are back to the normal levels. In our current assets, our accounts receivables are trading just where they were at year end, so no big changes there. One of the biggest changes that we have been seeing is our construction in progress category compared to the year end where we left it off. We were at 94 million right now we are 174 and just only in last month itself we have gained 36 million in construction in progress so we're just continuing to build in our liability section of the balance sheet on the next page we do see a decrease in our accounts payable and our accrual liability that is due to the timing of when we are closing the books at year end and unwinding of all those accruals as we continue to move on within the year on the other hand, our notes payable category continues to increase as we are using all the short term notes to fund all of our construction progress and all the other building. When we move on to our next statement, uh, income statement of ours, we would see our charges for services revenue. When we compare it to this time around last year, we are pretty much the same where we were. The slight decrease that we see is due to the PC, PPRF rates that we have decreased over the period of time. On the other hand, our operating expenses is slight, slightly higher than where we were at this point in time last year. That is due to our purchase power costs that have substantial increase in there and the other services and charges. Other services and charges also includes all the professionals and legal fees that we are paying for all of our various projects that we are involved in currently. 
When we move on to our cash flow, we have a positive cash flow for our operations, which we did in last year. So very, very excited about that. That is just due to the timing, as I mentioned the last year, and as we continue to increase our EP and you know, decrease our AR. On the financing activities, you will see a negative cash flow, but that's what we want to see as we are building, we are utilizing all those funds, and that's where they're all going between financing and investing activities. So we're just doing great all in all. Any questions for me? Thank you, Renu. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, uh, in continuation of uh, financial overview, this is a little bit of a snapshot for February. I know that uh, Renu just went over the uh, January, uh, the, um, January statements, but uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the purchase power costs. Uh, that we saw in the February timeframe. Uh, obviously, uh, February was a somewhat crazy time in the uh, energy markets. We had very high um, purchase power costs. I wanted to kind of show you a comparison uh, between what we saw this February in comparison to the prior February of last year. Our purchase power costs totaled about $117 million uh, for, for that month, uh, compared to about $9.2 million in the prior year. But we do have a call option in place, which we had purchased a couple of years ago, which really acts as an insurance uh, against the high power costs, which really benefited us in February. You can see that we got revenues of about 86.6 million. So net, our purchase power costs were about 30.3 million for the month, compared to about 10 million in the prior year. Uh, on the generation side of the business, uh, we purchased about 17.7 million in fuel costs uh, for the month of February as natural gas prices were significantly higher uh, really than we've seen them ever. Um, last year, uh, there was no cost for fuel as our units were offline last February, so you didn't see any uh, cost there. But we did sell that generation into the market for almost 25 million, so there was a net gain of about 7.2 million uh, from generation and really just basically a non-event in that category for the prior year. So in total, our total purchase power costs were about 23 million compared to right about 10 million in the prior year. Um, we had projected for February of this year for those costs to be at about 11 and a half million. So uh, 23 million was substantially higher than those estimates. Uh, fortunately, as you know, we have a power cost recovery factor and we have basically reserves in place totaling about 13.3 million before we went into the month of February that we were able to utilize to make up that difference uh, from the $11.5 million projected cost to the $23 million actual cost. So that uh, allows us the ability to not have to create volatility. We don't have to uh, charge higher rates uh, for our customers related to this storm. Uh, I know there has been a, a good amount of uh, maybe confusion, maybe concern uh, from looking across the state at, you know, high power bills related to the storm. But fortunately, with the tools we had in place uh, and with the power cost recovery reserve that was in place, we were able to avoid any rate impact for our customers related to the storm. So that, that finalizes uh, the, the financial presentation item number seven. In Questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Questions? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Taylor. So, Mr. Bertram, that all that that you just went over, that'll be reflected in next month's. Yes, in report. next month's financials will look pretty crazy. The uh, We'll have a very large uh, receivable balance. We'll have a very large payable balance. So the uh, Overall, the uh, financial statements will be uh, have a little bit of a balloon effect. But by the time we get back into uh, March, it'll look very much like normal again. So. So the um, balance sheet item for the deferred revenues will basically be that will basically be down to around the four hundred thousand. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Thank you, Mr. Bertram. Brings us to item nine: impacts of the flooding event on March twelfth, twenty twenty one. Actually, number eight. Uh, I want number have eight. A bit of an overview for the customer billing. Well, the new billing system. We so. can go back. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I wanted just to you know remind you that we we did go live with our new billing system uh, on uh, February the twenty second. 
Uh, the week before that was a very, very busy week. Many people worked many, many hours to get everything in place. I uh, wanted just to kind of go over some of the you know, impacts to our customers uh, throughout that event and um, kind of what went on shortly thereafter. Um, best news of all is that uh, all of the billing data was converted successfully, accurately. We have no issues uh, with the data itself, with the integrity of the, uh, of, of the dollars and, and, and consumption reads. All of that uh, worked very, very well. Uh, we'd gone through lots and lots of uh, testing uh, prior to the go live and had ensured that that would indeed uh, be an accurate transition of all of the data. Um, one of the things that occurred through the go live was with a new system that hadn't billed before when a customer would pull up their account online, it was basically blank. There was no information that had been populated and that caused some confusion for our customers. But what happened was once that first bill out of that system billed, all of that information populated. So at that point in time, depending on where the customer is throughout the month, that information would populate on the website. Um, bills still went out like normal. Uh, the IVR could, could give information like normal. Uh, a lot of folks though logged on and didn't see anything and it created some concern, especially with some of the news stories uh, across the state uh, with uh, you know, high bills for customers, which did not happen here. Uh, but uh, so we had a, a uptick in call volume. I'll talk about that on the next slide. Some things that occurred throughout the process though, customers were able to continue to use on the same login information that did not change. The only thing really that changed dramatically was their account number went from a 14 digit number to a 10 digit number. Auto pay continued as normal. So if you were set up on auto pay, you really had nothing to worry about. Your account was uh, debited as it normally would be. Um, the only customers who had to re-sign up for auto pay were uh, customers who have multiple properties and they um, had been giving no given notice in advance of this with letters that had gone out to give them the, the process there. Uh, payments that we received during just immediately prior to the go live, we held those until go live and then processed all those payments basically at, at, at one time. Uh, but as you recall, we did discontinue late fees and disconnects really for the whole month, uh, well, the, the rest of February and the entire month of March. So if anybody's bill was held up or payment was held up by the go live, that didn't impact them, uh, that we continued to provide the service and we, and we booked their payment when it was uh, received and there was no issue with that. We continued with a very significant uh, communication strategy and plan uh, included, you can see all the items that were included there, press release, uh, onserts and inserts, social media, signage in the lobby and on the doors, uh, direct mail, our website and direct emails to customers who have signed up for that. So uh, all of that uh, was, it was a very uh, intense time because there was a lot of activities that, that went on. Um, throughout that, we did receive a significant number of phone calls. A lot of it had to do with the absence of an account number on the website. We uh, explained that we had uh, everyone who called in, we helped as quickly as we could. Uh, we did have call volumes that were average throughout the time period, about 2,300 a day, uh, compared to about 1,000 a day uh, in the prior year. At those levels, it's just not physically possible to answer all of them. And so a busy signal uh, sometimes ensues when the calls reach very, very high levels. There were some days that were in the 3,500 up range, uh, so very high levels of calls. We also are accepting uh, emails uh, and many, many customers utilize that approach uh, to just email us say, and we would provide them their account number or any information they needed to, to help them with their payment. We also, through the process, combined accounts. There would be some customers who would have many accounts on our system. Part of this conversion was to consolidate most of those. Uh, so you get one statement with a listing of all of your individual meters separately listed, but all rolled up into one bill. For most people, that was a very good uh, thing. Uh, there were some customers who did not like that. Uh, we were able to easily unwind those and, and separate those back out if they needed to pay from different bank accounts or things like that. But that did drive some of the call volume as well. But really, those were the driving questions that we got throughout. Uh, it was just some changes that uh, our, you know our customers, uh, we were trying to help our customers through uh, as, we, as we move forward. This, this graphic at the bottom 
it really shows a, a daily uh, count of emails that we see coming through. Before go live, we average very little through that, about 29 a day. Uh, shortly after the go live, we were averaging over 700 a day, almost 800 a day in emails with a peak of about 1,700 in one day. Uh, very, very difficult to respond to all of those very quickly. So it did take us a couple of days in some instances to respond to our customers. But you can see at this present time, at least since uh, the flood, which is the second uh, uh, vertical line on this chart, uh, we've had a much lower level of uh, email traffic. Um, one of the, uh, I guess, uh, positives out of the flood event when we were closed, uh, as we had uh, some of our call center reps uh, getting access to computers again, uh, they were able to start responding and helping us get caught up on some of the backlog of emails that had come through. And so we were able to do that uh, through some of the downtime when the billing, when the customer service center wasn't operational. I'll go through some of that information shortly. But we did have significant uh, customer interaction. Uh, we, we did the best we could. It was, it was a very large amount. Um, and hopefully at this point in time, well, it definitely everybody at this point in time has their account numbers, have the information, uh, and things are leveling out. Um, there's still a lot of activities going on to ensure everything is accurate. We're still on a daily basis reviewing a significant number of bills to ensure they're billing correctly and that there, there are no issues at all. There's always going to be lots of little things uh, after the go live of a, of a billing conversion that uh, we'll deal with for some time. But overall, customer impacts should be very minimal at this point in time. However, even though I've talked about some of the uh, concerns that were expressed during the go live, I wanted to point out again some of the benefits that we will see over time and will we'll continue to benefit both our employees and mostly customers. Um, you know, one of the things with that account number change is now customers will have the same account number for life. Uh, currently, in the existing billing system, every time you moved or had a new address, you got a new account number, and so that was continually changing. Uh, one of the changes in this new system is that once you have an account, it is yours, it stays with you, not with your premise. So uh, that hopefully will help uh, individuals going forward. Lots of streamlining of business processes uh, that save time ultimately for both our customers and our employees. We had a new IVR that also went into effect on the same date, so, so not only did we have uh, the new billing system go live, we also had a new IVR interactive voice response when you call in the automated phone system. And then we also had a new work order system go live at the same time, as well as the in integration of all of the advanced metering infrastructure um, data that had to all be brought in during all of this. We also upgraded our kiosks. You'll notice in the lobby, um, our kiosks are over here for the time being. So they're all brand new. Uh, they're easier to use, uh, should be a lot quicker. Uh, so that, that should be another benefit for our customers. One thing also that's a great benefit is if you happen to get back from a vacation on Saturday night and your electricity is off and you're like, oh, I forgot to pay my bill. Now you have to do is call in on the IVR or go online on your account, make your payment, and it will automatically be restored. You don't have to wait for somebody to come out physically to reconnect your services. So uh, that's one really great advantage uh, with the new system. Flexibility with the cloud. This system is all in the cloud, the IVR, our billing system, everything. What really benefited us during the flood event was there was no interruption in our system because there was no systems that could get damaged with flooding or with any activity. It was all uh, somewhere else. Uh, and so that was one really great benefit that we've already seen uh, related to, to that uh, unfortunate circumstance that occurred. And then also increased security with the new system, much higher levels of encryption and safety for all of our customers and their data. So those are some really good things. From the end user standpoint, from the, from the employees, some of the things that are really beneficial that will save us money over time. Uh, obviously the move in and move outs, when customers move into a, a, a home or an apartment or move out, that's simplified, it's all remote. Uh, trucks don't have to roll for those types of activities. Uh, our employees have immediate access to all sorts of advanced metering infrastructure data for the customer when they call in. They can look exactly by day. Uh, what that or by 50 every 15 minutes what their usage looks like and if they can help them pinpoint issues if there's a spike in usage or something hopefully they can uh, determine an exact time when that happens 
Uh, there are real-time outage notifications for our employees. So we know on an account by account basis, if someone calls in, our, our call center rep can know immediately whether that customer has energy or not. Uh, we eliminated a lot of paper uh, that we've been using for a number of years. Uh, everything is uh, uh, online and much more efficient, especially with our field services. For example, on, uh, on a meter, for example, it, our system has the exact latitude and longitude of that, so they can find it much easier than they ever have been able to. There's a lot of times they'll go out into the field and just can't find it. It was hide and seek, and so now they know exactly where all of these service points are located. And also just the complete automation of, of routing of our field service, much more efficient. Uh, it, uh, it really is a time saver for, for those field employees. So that's kind of uh, an update on how the billing system conversion went and then some of the benefits that we can now start to enjoy. So if any of y'all have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer those. Mr. Field. Ms. Bertrand, a uh, question regarding the IVR platform. Does it integrate with your collection system in terms of delinquent accounts, payment arrangements, things of that nature? Yes. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Did you need more information than just a yes? <laughs> Don't want to expound any more. That's part of the, um, automated, the automated reconnection portion of it. So when a customer calls in, they're able to enter their account number. Thank you. I understand the reconnect side of it. What about the disconnect? Delinquent accounts. Does it call customers? Well, it, actually, there's more. There, the yeah. yeah, the outbound calls still continue. Actually, there's more outbound calls than there have been historically, correct? So we've actually increased the number of outbound calls. Um, actually, with the new system, customers get a little bit longer than they historically did in the system to get the bill paid. Uh, so there, there are some additional advantages before the disconnect occurs. And of course, disconnect is automatic now rather than, you know, sending someone out. So It's not on site. <laughs> it is, but it isn't. <laughs> Yeah, but but again, there are more there are more warnings to the customer, and there's a little bit more time, so that hopefully will help right. in those situations. Right. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments? All right. Thank you, Andy. Now we'll go to agenda item nine right. and talk uh, about the great nine. flood. Um, as most of you know, there, there was a, a flooding event at the call center uh, and actually in, in this facility as well. Um, and wanted to kind of give you an overview of what happened, how that impacted our operations uh, going forward. So um, the event occurred on the evening of March the 10th. Um, I think Michelle and I got a call around 10 o'clock. We have 24 hour dispatchers in that facility and got a call that there was water coming in the facility. And so uh, that kicked off a, a long evening. Um, we were able to vacate those dispatchers uh, very quickly uh, as the water continued to rise in that facility. And really within a, a little over an hour, we were actually able to relocate that office out to water dispatch. Water has their own dispatchers, but they're not 24 hours a day. So luckily all of those um, workstations were available to us that night. So we, we, we knew we had overnight to be able to utilize. And really we had that entire weekend because uh, they, they would not be uh, utilizing the water dispatch area over the weekend. So we had a, a good place to put them very quickly. Uh, we were, they were able to get out there. We grabbed computers, took them out there, set them up, uh, and were able to get back online very quickly. So customers did not have really, but just a little over an hour worth of, of not being able to contact a dispatcher if they needed someone. Um, at that point in time, uh, there was the fire department was here, our, our wastewater department was here, ServPro was here, beginning to already start a water extraction from the facility uh, beginning that night. Um, what we did uh, operationally on Saturday, we, we met on Saturday morning, uh, with all the supervisors, uh, we, we met in this building, we began to identify locations where we could house a call center. 
over 100 employees. Um, we um, also needed to identify what equipment needs. There was a lot of uh, computers that were, were damaged with a flooding event. And so we did not have access to a lot of the equipment that we would normally have. So we were needing to identify exactly what we needed to let our information technology department know what they needed to supply to us. Fortunately, they had a good amount of, of stock uh, in place uh, of computers that they could provide to us very, very quickly and telephones. Um, so we were able to provide that information. Uh, we came up with all of that. We were updating messaging on our IVR, on our, beginning to do it on our website on Saturday. On that day, we also were actually able to move the kiosks from the existing lobby to uh, the Citizens Tower lobby as we have relocated our lobby basically here. In the um, southeast corner of the lobby is, uh, was a desk already established for security for the, for the most part. Uh, we've taken over that and um, our, custom, or our um, in person customer representatives are now housed there. Uh, and then we also have greeters in the lobby. I'll show you some pictures of that in a moment. Um, Sunday was a really big day for us. Uh, again, we met uh, that morning. Uh, we began getting the lobby set up, everything that we would need for opening day on Monday. Uh, we started to move the dispatch. Remember the water dispatch was gonna need their offices come Monday morning. So we knew we had to find a new location for water dispatch. We moved them out to the fire marshal's office. There is a classroom there that we uh, moved them to. Um, and this is with the help of facilities and information technology and telecom at the city. They just did a fabulous job throughout. They were at our beck and call and were able to do things very, very quickly, much quicker than I would have ever anticipated. Uh, one of our other departments, account support, uh, we began setting them up at the tower. Uh, there is an office uh, just next door to this uh, chamber that there's a conference room. So we have uh, moved to that department, sitting around a conference table uh, with all of their equipment. Uh, we also began moving our field services uh, department out to Municipal Hill, where the other LPNL distribution and transmission offices are located. And we began to set up their uh, units that have to charge and they, they dock. And so we moved all of that equipment out to the, uh, the hill for setup and moving that supervisor out there and changed the location for those individuals to uh, begin their work day as they show up in the morning. They go out there now rather than coming uh, to the uh, utility call center. Um, we also began setting up the call center. We were able to utilize the police department's auditorium. Uh, so we uh, began setting that up. That was a very significant uh, project uh, and a large amount of employees and equipment that had to be moved there. Uh, we changed our IVR messaging to indicate that we'd be closed on Monday and Tuesday of that week uh, as we continued to get the call center up and running. Um, we put out press releases on the move of the lobby and the closure of the, uh, of the lobby at the other facility. We identified uh, the needed um, items from the employees desks that were uh, in the, the lower level at the call center. Uh, what did they need to actually do their job once uh, we got the call center set up? So we were able to have access. It was extremely wet and slippery down there, but we were very careful. I don't think anyone got injured uh, throughout that event, but we were able to retrieve some of the information and, and data and uh, equipment that we might need to do our job on a daily basis. Um, we also began setting up our collections department at the health department. We're spread out all over the city now, uh, making friends with all the other departments at the city. So we uh, were able to relocate everybody. Everyone finally had a home. Uh, they certainly weren't uh, the best place to be. They're not a good long-term solution, but they are a place to actually uh, maintain uh, operations and keep in contact with customers. And then Monday, uh, we were able to open the lobby. So from a customer perspective, uh, there wasn't any, anything missed there, at least for in person. We did bring in a number of greeters uh, to, to man the lobby, to also stand outside of the building across the street to direct people to come over here to where uh, obviously it was different for them to, to come to a different place. Uh, we have spacing out in the lobby for three customer service reps. We started with five greeters out front. I don't think we have quite that many right now as things have slowed down a little bit, but we we uh, staff that up as 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 depending on how busy that is. Call center again was closed on Monday. Um, we were able to go in and uh, folks could re uh, remove at least the personal items that weren't damaged from the flood. Uh, so they were able to get some of their personal belongings, get those out of there uh, before they started really removing everything. 
and then uh, continue the call center set up on the rest of the day Monday. We were able to open the call center on Tuesday. So every, I mean, on, yeah, on, no, on, we were still closed on Tuesday, but we were able to open on Wednesday uh, in the new facility. Um, just a few pictures. Um, you can see the kind of the hallway there. That's really after the water had been removed, uh, but you can see all the mud and silt remaining. Um, on the picture on the right, you can see a white arrow. That level on the desk was about as high as the water was. It, it completely filled the bottom drawer, every bottom drawer, and some of the next drawer up. So uh, most, most of the filing cabinets are two drawers, so most of the uh, information in all of those uh, desk drawers or filing cabinets were destroyed. Hopefully we'll be able to um, retrieve those. They're, they're being dried out and cleaned and processed so we can hopefully not lose too much data. Some more pictures you can see, really just uh, kind of the mud prints on the carpet there and some of the, just the issues there in the, in the hallway. So again, uh, a relocation of 118 employees, uh, about a little over 70 of those actually have offices. So the rest of them are filled. Uh, so we didn't have to find 118 offices, but a little over 70 or at least working locations. So again, the lobby is in this building. The call center is at PD. Uh, dispatch is at fire marshal. They will ultimately move up to the eighth floor uh, next to our 311 call center, uh, at least for an interim period of time. But hopefully, and once the elevators are working in this facility, uh, elevators are still not operational. So that's why we have all of these departments on the first floor somewhere. Account support, who is in the first floor now, will ultimately move up to the floor that we occupy on the fifth floor. So we'll have 13 additional employees on our floor we found spaces for. Um, collections, again, I said was out the health department. Our uh, customer information systems group, or we call them the USS group, they are all working mostly from home. They have the capabilities to do that. We do have a few of their employees that we found uh, offices in the tower uh, for them to work out of. And then again, our field services are reporting to work out at Municipal Hill uh, before they head out into the field. So here you can see the lobby on the southeast corner. You can see uh, that setup that we have. It's been working very well. Um, and uh, handling the, the flow of customers we have. Uh, pe people can check in, uh, our greeter will greet them, check them in, they can go sit on the, the couch and wait their turn and then we'll call them up as, as the, the time comes up. So it works very well. The kiosks are next, really closer to the elevators. Um, and so those are located there. The money changer is also available there for them to use too. This is a customer dispatch uh, group you can see how they're situated right now these are not really very good locations for folks who are on the phone all day long uh, the, uh, the the sound in the room the echoing makes it very difficult for them to talk on the phone but, but we're happy to have a place to be uh, and it and it works for now but uh, for a long-term solution it's probably not the best our collections department again sitting around a table uh, with all of their equipment and needs uh, in a relatively small space Account support, in a, this is the group that's uh, kind of next door to this room in the tower, again, sitting around a conference table. Our call center, uh, basically set up in folding chairs and folding tables. Uh, we have them uh, all occupying the police department auditorium, which really echoes and sound really carries. So it's really not good for a lot of people on the phone all at the same time, but, but again, we're, we're making do. Um, anyway, that kind of gives you an idea of uh, all of the activities. We have a spectacular group of supervisors, uh, Jamie, Michelle, or some of those that, uh, that lead that group that, uh, that, that all of their uh, supervisors and managers came in over that weekend. We had the assistance of, of anything we needed from the city to help us make this relocation. Uh, it, was, it was very well done, very organized by the end of it all, even though there was a lot of mayhem uh, in between, um, but we are happy to say that we're uh, back in operation again, just uh, spread out in about seven different locations. So anyway, any questions that y'all might have? Ms. Stafford. Andy, just a huge congratulations to you and this staff to be creative and flexible and do this in record time and certainly the cooperation of all the city uh, to help you. It's, it's highly unusual, but certainly the West Texas way. So thank you. Yes, thank you. And I didn't mention, you know, obviously the city manager, Jerry Atkinson and Bill Howerton, the deputy city manager, were here all weekend long as, as well as 
really anybody we needed. So it was one of those experiences where you, maybe you work closer with some folks that you haven't gotten to work close with in a good period of time and it builds some, some good bonds, you know, and it was a, it was a, if there's anything good out of all of this, I think that was a, a positive event. So. Other questions or comments? Uh, you may have mentioned how long till back to normal, did you say? That is not entirely undetermined at this point in time, but um, we're expecting, I think the estimation is 12 to 18 months. Okay. Anything else on item nine? Thank you, Andy. Mm -hmm. All right, item 10, presentation and discussion by the director of the EUB, um, Mr. McCullough, on the transition to ERCOT. All right, so I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about kind of where we're at in the ERCOT, ERCOT transition. So uh, we're, we're getting close. We're two months away from uh, plugging in the jumper cable. Uh, Substation transmission line construction, all of those projects are nearing completion. You heard Jason's report a minute ago, so those are all falling in place according to schedule. Uh, same for LPNL projects and voltage conversion projects. The, the guys have done a super job on voltage conversion and uh, working on the last two sub, substations this week, and then we'll be done with that piece of it. A lot of efforts going on with uh, coordinating with ERCOT and all the integration activities there, both with the models, the testing, communications, infrastructure, and all of the uh, paperwork that we have to send back and forth to, to ERCOT. Chris Sims has been a big, big help on some of that, but uh, cutover plan. So this is uh, the next, the next phase of this will be once we get all the projects complete and get ready to make the transition, we've got to, we've, we've got to have a plan. It's got to be reviewed and approved by all, all the players. And so the, the, that plan has been developed. It's been shared with ERCOT, with Southwest Power Pool, and with uh, Encore and SPS, the two entities that we are connected with and will be connected with. So they've had a chance to review it and comment on it as well. But our plan is to perform a substation by substation cutover on May 29th and May 30th, which is Memorial Day weekend. There's a couple of reasons why we selected that weekend. One, it's a, it's a time, you know, the weekend load is typically lower than the weekday load. When you start getting in late May, depending on where temperatures are at that time, you can have some pretty, pretty high loads on your electrical system. We want the loads to be low when we make this switch over because we'll be, uh, We'll be stressing the system out a little bit with a lot of radial feeds as we're making the transition. So we want to give ourselves as much flexibility as we can. <clears throat> and then it's also the closest weekend to June 1st, which has kind of been our target date all along is the June 1st date. So that's, there's probably no perfect time. I mean, somebody's going to be inconvenienced that weekend. I guarantee you. Uh, if you think about doing it during the week, somebody's going to be inconvenienced. A lot of your commercial establishments, businesses, uh, accounting firms, legal for law firms, uh, banks would, would be more inconvenienced this facility during, during the week than what it would be on the weekend. <clears throat> so like I said, no perfect time, but that's the target, target date for uh, making the cutover right now. So about 70% of LPNL's customers will will be transitioned. That means that roughly 70,000 customers, customers of ours will experience a brief interruption of service. It could be anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes, hopefully on the shorter end of that. We've got to do, we're going to kind of use a leapfrog frog approach. We'll have substation crews kind of spreading out along the, along the line and line crews and servicemen will be available as well. But so we'll have to physically isolate the, the part of our system that's on the SPP transmission network from the part that's on the ERCOT network. And then you disconnect it, you move your open point, you reconnect it, and you just keep working your way around the system that way. So that's kind of how, how it will work. But we can't tie the two together at any, at any time because you know one of them's here and one of them's here and they, well, you never, they're not synchronized. So uh, 
There, there will be a need for significant customer communications, public communications during this event. Uh, Mr. Rose is working on some detailed communications plans, uh, which we'll be rolling out in, in the near future. All right, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some, some questions that have come up, some suggestions that we ought to consider not integrating or that we ought to pause, pause the integration. Uh, you know, I wanted to just restate the, the, the reasons that we are making this move to start with are still valid. We think the ERCAP market has some uh, attractiveness to uh, wholesale contracts. Wholesale power is, is easier to buy and sell and trade in the ERCAP market. Uh, the customers can get some benefits from, from that market that they, they could never get if we stayed in the SPP market. And beyond the ability to provide an affordable and diverse energy portfolio, joining ERCOT gives the governing bodies the ability to, at some point, bring retail choice to Lubbock, which we've talked about publicly for a long time. I think that's still the desire. Uh, so at some point, you, you guys will be uh, considering that again and make, make, taking formal action on that. But. That's not available in the SPP market. It is available in, in the ERCAP market. And so another reason for doing that. So I want to talk a little bit about, okay, let's just think about if, if we were to delay, what would, what would the impacts be? And there are a number of significant impacts to a delay or a permanent halt in uh, integrating. One is financial expenditures related to the construction of the transmission infrastructure. Almost $400 million, $400 million worth of new facilities uh, are under construction or have already been completed. Uh, you know, there's, there's some, uh, those costs have to be dealt with at some point if you change, if you change your mind at the, at the end of the project. The stranded investment in transmission infrastructure, some of the facilities that have been built are specific to Lubbock. They would, they would have no usefulness other than connecting Lubbock to the grid. So there'll be some stranded investment if that decision was made. We're counting on a transmission revenue stream once we get to ERCOT to support the, the assets that we're putting in. We've got work going on at the PUC right now to try to get a, a rate for the first time for LPNL. And so that <clears throat> loss of that revenue stream would, would hurt our financial position and hurt our uh, financial models and what we've presented in our budget on an annual basis. So it's, it's an important factor. Uh, we have acquired some energy purchase. We've made some energy purchases in the ERCOP market. Looking ahead, because you can't wait till the last minute and then and then start layering in your hedges. We've been we've been buying fire for the last three or four months. For once we, once we get to ERCOP, we've been buying it for the time period of 2021 through 2023. So we've got some energy that that's sitting there ready to ready to go when we get to ERCOP. Uh, if if we if a decision were to be made not to go, then, then those would have to be sold at cost and would not sure whether you'd recover your cost or not on that. The, uh, and then if we stay in SPP, we don't have contracts beyond May 31st, 2021 in SPP, other than the partial requirements contract, which will continue, but <clears throat> that doesn't cover our entire load. So we would have, we would not have power supply in SPP after May 31st. And then we'd have firm transmission service is, is not there after May 31st, 2020, 2021 for the affected load or for the four uh, tie lines that we, that we have coming in from SPS right now. In addition, the, uh, see, I guess I already covered that. Maybe I jumped ahead without getting to that slide. I've already talked about all of that. Uh, so it's uncertain at this time what legislative changes will be made. We know the legislature is in session right now. They're considering uh, a lot of things that relate to ERCOT, the touch ERCOT, but we're not sure exactly how, what will come out of that body. But it appears from, from watching some of the hearings, reading some of the bills, that the fundamental energy only market structure is, is going to be us is going to survive and continue on. 
that's been an important aspect of our, of our decision from early on is the energy only aspect where you don't have to pay for physical generating capacity, capacity contracts, uh, which are expensive, have been expensive. And so that's a, it appears that that aspect of the market will continue on. So there's a, some, some important features in the in some of the bills that limit the risk going forward. So uh, one thing is the, the the high price cap in the market will be limited in terms of the number of hours that can be uh, deployed, which you know mitigates some of the risk that market participants would have going forward. The largest risk appears to be this uh, short paid amounts that are out there right now. There's because of the February event, there's a lot of uh, entities that were not able to pay their bills. So there's a big short paid amount in ERCOT and, and that will have to be dealt with at some point. One of the ways that that could be dealt with is uplifting it to the, to the market participants that are not in default. That's the way the rules are written. So exactly how that will happen and what, how that will be passed on to market participants is what we're watching very closely. The current, the current rules require that if they uplift, it will be done based on uh, market participants activity in the month preceding the default. So default occurred in February, if you look at market participants activity in the market in January, and that's how you, you kind of prorate everybody's percentage of, uh, of, of the uplift based on your activity, your relative activity compared to the rest of the market participants. Well, we weren't in the market in, in January. We weren't in the market in February. We won't be in the market until June. So the way the protocols are currently written, we wouldn't be assessed to any of that, but we're watching it because uh, we, we, we know that it's a big issue that has to be dealt with. We wanna make sure that we're protected from that. The, the two big things that went wrong in February was generating plants didn't come online and the gas and part of it was because the gas production facilities couldn't get gas to the generating plants. A lot of freeze ups, both in the uh, wellheads, the, some of the facilities, midstream facilities, and then of course generating plants. So one of the things that I feel very confident will come out of this legislation is mandatory weatherization with some penalties for lack of performance significant penalties. So I think you will see massive uh, efforts underway to, to weatherize both the generating plants and the uh, natural gas infrastructure. There will also be improved communications between the natural gas companies and electric companies. One of the things that happened was as rolling, rolling rotating outages took place, there were some cases where the electric company disconnected power to the, some of the critical gas infrastructure. So with better coordination, that, that won't happen. And then you're not, you know, taking off facilities that you really need to keep, keep the generating units running. So with all that said, uh, we still believe the benefits of integrating with ERCOT continue to outweigh the, the, the known risks of halting uh, our process we've been working on since 2015. So uh, we're recommending that we continue our efforts to integrate into ERCOT. That's consistent with your prior direction and we, we're, we're moving forward. Any questions? Questions for Mr. McCullough. Uh, the, only, the only question or concern I guess I would have is that Memorial Day weekend on that is that a last year graduation or anything going on that weekend texas tech i think's a week before that maybe but i, I don't know for my, my niece is graduating but she's earlier in may it's not when that's from texas tech but i'm i think it's earlier i was making sure that wasn't yeah, something i'm not that, sure about what what's what schools we can do some checking on that but okay i think our, our goal here is we know we're going to inconvenience somebody <laughs> whenever we do it so we've, we've got to communicate and make sure that folks are ready and prepared for it good deal Thank you, Mr. McCullough. Um, <clears throat> item 11, uh, legislative and regulatory matters, Mr. Rose. So 
So this is this is the first of these uh, legislative recaps that I've given this session, because typically as legislative sessions go, they begin at the start of January and they get to work on the budget pretty quickly, but then you don't really start seeing the passing of bills and things moving until you get to April or sometimes really even mid-April. Um, but obviously for us and for many, this is a, this is a unique session in that the electricity issues, specifically ERCOT, are pushed to the forefront. So what I want to do really quick is just give a rec recap of what we are tracking, give an analysis of Senate Bill 3 and its committee substitute, and then quickly hit on what we anticipate to be uh, the pathway of legislative action going forward. Um, so just really as an as a, um, overview here, we work closely with Texas Public Power Association. David sits on the board and, and I sit on several of the committees and especially as it relates to legislative session, we work very closely with them uh, because obviously municipal utilities around the state have very similar issues in this session, particularly uh, it's important that we are all communicating. And so myself and Jenny Smith have participated in uh, conference calls multiple times a week over the past you know month or so as we've been gearing up to where we are today. We also work with our legislative consultants Hilco um, in Austin to track bills of interest uh, and keep up with what's going on at the legislature. Our current track list for Hilco consists of 336 filed bills and the track list for TPPA is a little over 350 filed bills. Obviously a lot of those are are the same. Um, but really, as you can see, the, the bills of interest, you know, their broad range, it's security, it's transmission generation, um, a variety of, of renewable issues such as electric vehicles, eminent domain, uh, and then just oversight and, and general municipal utility governance. So that's, those are typically what we're gonna be watching. Um, but this session, certainly, ERCOT reform is the biggest issue. So there are over 50 filed bills that specifically relate to ERCOT and its reform. Senate Bill 3 that I mentioned is, it has become the, the vehicle that will be the omnibus bill that carries most of the reforms that you see in ERCOT. There are still a lot of ancillary bills out there that probably still have value if they don't get included in Senate Bill 3. Uh, you'll see those passed individually, but most of the reforms are going to be housed in this large bill going forward. There was some discussion up front on who would carry that bill. Uh, Senator Kelly Hancock out of North Richland Hills is the uh, chairman of Senate Business and Commerce. He was originally the one that was slated to do it, uh, but a bit, uh, uh, Charles Schwartner out of Georgetown eventually became the author and carrier of this bill. And, and as I say, it's anticipated that it will be changed numerous times before it gets to the governor's desk. So I've, I've put a lot of information on the following slides. I'm not gonna read all of them, but I'm quickly gonna hit the high points as we go forward because there are some important issues. David pointed out some of them, uh, but first off, Senate Bill 3 establishes an emergency alert system that incorporates uh, TDEM, which is the emergency management system. A lot of the conversation coming into this, act, into this, uh, this bill's, uh, to basically, when we went through what we went through during the winter storm, there were many that said that they did not get emergency alerts as they should. The way that it was currently set up, you know, providers got those alerts and then they pass it on to the customers. There is a desire to have a better statewide uh, alert system, similar to what we have like LBK alerts here. So when you start going into this process and you have these rotating outages, you're not just relying on say an LPNL to communicate with these customers. You want them to do that, but there's also a statewide notification system that reaches more people. They can get that information. Um, David hit on this. It requires the weatherization of all generation transmission and natural gas facilities and pipelines in the state of Texas and failure to comply with it can be up to a million dollars per day. One thing that we're looking at that's interesting to us is that this language changed from winterization to weatherization. Obviously, Texas is a summer peaking state and we mostly focus on having reliability in the summer months. This was a unique storm that hit reliability issues in the winter months. 
but saying weatherization, we're still taking a look at exactly what that means because winterization is something very specific. Uh, weatherization is a broader term that can have larger financial impacts. It, uh, it ensures that critical customers are informed about you know, rotating outages and blackouts. Uh, and it also talks about the designation of critical load. As David mentioned, um, there was an issue in the Permian Basin where some of the natural gas facilities were not thought of as critical. They were part of those that were cut. Therefore, they could not produce and, and supply to uh, folks that they needed to supply to in terms of natural gas. So it expands that out and makes sure that those folks are on the list. Um, it certainly requires generators to obtain approval before conducting maintenance during winter and summer peaks, which is something that they do now, but it, it expands that out. And, and it, it requires wind and solar generators to do a little bit more in terms of providing specific load information. And it prohibits retail electric variable rates. Now I'll talk about that in the committee substitute in a second, but that's what you heard of in all these news stories about customers getting eight, $9,000 bills. These were small commercial or residential customers that had either signed up not knowing what they were signed up for or signed up because they were duped into it, thinking that basically a company comes in and they charge you a monthly fee and then allow you to have access to go manage the wholesale market by yourself. Well, if you don't have a knowledge of what you're doing, you're going to be exposed like some of these folks were. So the original version just prohibits retail electric variable rate plans. It gets more specific in the committee sub. Um, Strengthens reporting related on-site generation for ERCOT, just so they make sure they know exactly how much capacity that, that's out there in an emergency situation. And it requires utility providers to defer collection of bills during an extreme weather emergency. We've done some of those things here at home, but across the board, it just kind of codifies that and says that in an emergency situation, you must you know, work with customers to not do shutoffs. And then after the fact, work, on, work with them on payment plans to get them caught back up and it directs the creation of a state energy plan. Now, the committee substitute, normally as this goes, you have a, a Senate bill that's filed and then it goes to Senate committee as this one did and went to Senate jurisprudence. A lot of changes happen in committee and then what gets passed out is the committee sub. And so then you just start talking about the committee sub going forward. So some of this is new and some of this is modified. Changes some language in terms of blackouts and power alert uh, systems. It changes the way the National Weather Service reports in terms of these events. Um, it, it, the Texas Energy Reliability Council, I believe is, is the acronym there. It uh, has them do kind of some better mapping of any energy supply chains as it relates to natural gas. Same thing with Railroad Commission. Um, and then and give some penalties uh, through Railroad Commission and, and the PUC. Uh, in, in, in terms of uh, the $1 million penalty cap. Gives more authority to the PUC and the Railroad Commission to, to authorize facilities to appropriate uh, weatherization issues. And it in the committee sub, this is what I was talking about earlier, where they had originally banned all the variable rate plans the committee sub changes it to just say that they're not allowed to be offered to residential and small commercial. So that a large commercial customer who has the wherewithal or the ability to hire a consultant to come in to manage the market for them, they can still have access to that. But it just sets that bar so that smaller entities cannot participate because it's assumed that they're not gonna have the ability or the wherewithal to, to manage that on their own or through a consultant. As David mentioned, it takes, the, uh, it takes the cap and reduces the amount of time that that can be in place to 12 hours. Um, it provides that ancillary services cannot exceed 100%, 150% of the uh, emergency high system wide cap offer at the time. It directs the PUC to, re to review price caps every five years. Um, so, when it got to the Senate floor, which is yesterday, they, they went through the bill and they accepted amendments. They actually moved through the bill fairly quickly. They didn't uh, allow for or accept as many amendments as 
we would have thought they would have, which tells me that a lot of work went into the Senate bill and the committee sub, and they feel like that covers everything. And the author being Senator Schwartner really was not open to accepting a lot of amendments or digging into it. But some of the important amendments that are included was that uh, mapping and other reporting requirements um, are exempt from open records or it protects them from that. There was a lot of discussion about that. Um, obviously there are aspects of the utility business where it's necessary that those be held confidential to protect the system. But Dean Whitmire, who's Dean of the Senate and others felt like the, that, that, those types of, of exemptions would not allow for transparency. And so there was a lot of debate about that. That was withdrawn, but basically because the author said that they were gonna go take it back, take a look at the Open Records Act and then come back with it at a later date, more refined. Because certainly it's important for us that our, our information not get exposed, our critical facilities, things that should be all confidential as we go through the process. Sets a six month timeline for agencies to write rules and, and do what they need to in terms of weatherization. Senator Menendez out of San Antonio really wanted this to be something that was effective immediately. If this bill passes with um, a, a two thirds majority, it will be implemented immediately, but they felt like the time limit was appropriate because folks need to work on this and they can't have this up and running immediately. So that was adopted. Um, requires intermittent resources, that's talking about renewable resources to procure ancillary services and provide from the market. This was a very controversial one because Senator Menendez and others in the Senate felt like that this hurt renewable resources. So this was contentious, but it ultimately passed on, on basically a party line vote of 1813. Um, so we'll see if in the House that gets amended, but it, it just, it puts more requirements on uh, solar and, and wind producers. Uh, another amendment was that it addresses the last, you know, the last 32 hours of, of pricing corrections. Um, this was one that, again, folks had different ideas of how you should to do this, but ultimately they decided that it was appropriate and put good guardrails on the system. So it ended up passing unanimously, but it was a little bit controversial. Um, and then the last one is just, it clarifies that the Railroad Commission may require operators in gas supply chains uh, to weatherize. This was a Springer bill, uh, Senator Springer. He ultimately withdrew this because he felt like it was covered in other parts of the bill. So obviously very complicated bill, large bill. I ran through that very quickly. Um, I, I can assure you that when I come back here at, at next month's board meeting, we'll have more clarity and there's gonna be a lot of things that are in this bill that are not and vice versa as they kind of work through and make their changes. So this is what we know is included in today, but it's gonna change a lot over the next few weeks. Interestingly enough, after they rolled in all of the amendments adopted and went to actually voting on the committee substitute for the bill, Senator Zaffarini um, spoke on behalf of the bill. Senator Zaffarini is, she has a lot of tenure. I think, I think short of uh, Dean Whitmire, she has the most years of service in the Senate. And she's actually a very strong supporter of cities and municipal utilities. So it was interesting that she stood up in support of this bill kind of shows that across the board, they're all in, in line with, with what they're trying to pass here. Lieutenant Governor Patrick stated obviously that a lot of work is, is still to be done, um, but did make a point of saying that he and others have an issue with the fact that this is gonna come as billions of dollars on a fiscal note. It's interesting that the governor, when he put his charge out, Governor Ab Abbott specifically said in his charge that we wanna fix these issues, but we also want the state to pay for it. As they work through this, you start having issues that stop becoming state funded and start becoming unfunded mandates to utilities and cities and, and, and folks otherwise. But leadership still has at least the motivation to try to figure out a funding mechanism for this so it doesn't all fall to the end consumer because that's, that's the fear. But even though there were some contentious amendments and people went back and forth about what was in the bill, it ultimately passed unanimously, uh, it was finally passed. So it will now be enrolled and sent over to the House. And I imagine it will probably be on the House committees 
first of next week and we'll start getting passed out. And I would imagine you might see it on the House floor in, in, in a couple of weeks. Um, the governor really, and, and Lieutenant Governor and Speaker have really cleared the way that they can um, kind of go around normal reporting rules to move as quickly as they can on this because outside of the budget, which is must pass every single session, this is the biggest emergency item and it's afforded all of those luxuries you have when it's designated as a priority emergency bill. So it's gonna continue to move quickly. So that's about as quick as I can go through that, but be happy to answer any questions. I will say up front that if you have detailed questions about how these things will be implemented, I may ask David to come back up here because I don't know all the ins and outs, uh, but happy to try to answer any questions that you may have. Questions for Mr. Rose. I'm gonna let you off easy. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> but no other business that brings us to the consent agenda. Um, there's items 12 through 20 on here. I would entertain a motion uh, to approve uh, items 12 through 20. So move. Have a motion by Mr. Boatman, need a second? Second. second. Have a second by Mr. Davis. All those in favor do so by saying aye. 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 Opposed by the same. Consent agenda passes 9-0. Brings us to item 21. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all.